Hey everyone. Let me see. Sorry about that. Hey everyone. So uh, so happy for everyone to join us uh, today um, to our webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and quickly share my screen so we can kick it off um, without further ado. I'll just uh, oh sorry. Put it on slideshow. Great. So really welcome, and uh, we are looking forward to talk to you today about the um, driving RI with automated DSR management, and uh, provide you some insights from industry leaders and talk about solutions, pains, the the new norms uh, around us. With me today, uh, Shireen Kenyon, uh, Data Protection Office of uh, Office Germany, and Senior Privacy Manager uh, at Chart Ninja. Um, in terms of uh, setting the stage, the agenda for today, uh, we are going to go ahead and talk, uh, have a quick round of uh, introduction, um, and then um, talk a little bit about common challenges and, uh, and norms, and uh, introducing MinOS into Infinite Integration Builder, um, and have some time for, for questions. Um, so. Bef without further ado, um, I just want to have like a quick check. Shirin, you with me here? I am. Hi, Kovi. All right, you see my screen because I'm I'm, I'm sharing in the. Um, I can. I think... All right, perfect. So let's go ahead and uh, and get started. Um, I think maybe let's start with a quick introduction. Uh, I let you start, Shirin, uh, and uh, and then let's go ahead. I'll I'll introduce myself, mine, and uh, we can. Uh, go straight in to talk a little bit about challenges and pains uh, around uh, data sub uh, DSRs, and uh, we'll go straight into the, the matter. Okay. Thanks, Kobe. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Shireen. Uh, I'm Data Protection Officer in Germany and Senior Privacy Manager across EMEA for Shark Ninja. Um, I have um, worked in quite a number of organizations as a privacy director um, consulting. Um, so the industry sectors that I've worked in, are, um, public sector, um, oil and gas, retail, manufacturing and financial services. And then of course now uh, I'm with Shark Ninja. So I've, I've got experience of working um, across many regulatory um, areas um multiple um places where we've got different legal basis and also um regulations and also worked with a number of privacy platforms so it's great to be with you here today and uh, good um, to be able to take the opportunity to see this this latest innovation from from kobe all right Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for uh, joining me, joining me today uh, uh, for the for this quick chat. Um, my name is uh, Kobe Sun. I'm the co-founder and chief product officer uh, here at MinOS. Um, in a matter of uh, I've been I've been with MinOS since tw uh, 2019, so uh, quite quite a long time now. Uh, but in terms of uh, my personal background, I spent some time couple of years working in uh, the venture capital uh, industry, uh, funding and investing in uh, in companies, um, predominantly in uh, consumer space, in uh, security, privacy spaces, and so on and so forth. Um, if I go even back, um, most of my background is around product uh, and consulting. And uh, basically, I connected together with Gal Ingel and Gal Goran, my partners. Um, and um, since then, we've become with this uh, journey on uh, um, building MinOS. Um, MinOS specifically was founded in uh, 2019, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, with uh, operations in the US, in the EU, um, a vast, you know, big uh, client base. We are funded by top tier uh, venture capitals uh, worldwide in the US, in the EU. Uh, supported and backed by uh, industry veterans um, is our, our advisory board. Um, essentially, what we do um, is we provide a governance layer for the enterprise data. So we support anything from 
um, you know, the data map of the organization, building uh, um, the discovery the, the, uh, and, and the visibility of what's going on within the organization. On, the top, on top of that, building um, the use cases and modules that range from privacy to IT to security. Um, so DSR is one of them that we are going to talk about today, but uh, also the, um, you know, anything that is related with uh, privacy assessment, private impact assessment, uh, audit security, and so on. Um, in terms of, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, loved by companies around the world, so companies in the US, in Canada, in uh, South America, Australia, um, and Europe and the US, uh, where we are uh, mostly present. And you can see here some of our uh, insights uh, and the input from, uh, from our clients. Um, I think what we wanted to talk about today and uh, the focus of this session um, is going to be around DSR. Uh, DSR is something that, um, you know, kind of, I would say the first in the checklist for, for companies. Uh, end users have privacy rights, delete my data, get a copy of my data, edit my data, and so on and so forth. And ever since 2018, uh, when GDPR came to force, um, you know, almost every vendor, every company uh, kind of try to look into the DSR uh, concept. What can we do in order to help the organizations find the data and actually automate this process because that's not part of the core business uh, uh, line. It's like a checklist of something that, they, that, that the organization needed to, to, to cater for. Um, but what we've seen uh, uh, that the general approach uh, over the years were that you know vendors try to provide a large uh, as possible catalog uh, of integrations um, and it became kind of the catalog race um, and uh, the question that I have for you Shirin is uh, you know before we dive into all those details um, is that enough from your experience you know how do you look into this uh, uh, kind of the trend or you know uh, the industry uh, changes uh, during the, the the past few years? Yeah, I think it's interesting that probably right at the very beginning, it was quite attractive to think that you could get as many connectors as possible and that was going to solve the problem um, that organizations met because prior to that, discovery was not something that um, w was really on the radar from a privacy uh, perspective. Uh, we knew we had to do some work, but it was never as burdensome as it became once GDPR came into play. But I think that um, it's it's safe to say that over my um, period of time working in different sectors, um, since those regulations came to play, that no organisation is the same. And even if I look at a catalogue and think, wow, they've got a great catalogue, that's still not going to work entirely for me because where we're, you know, we're wanting something to set up slightly differently. Our infrastructure is set up differently. Every organization is different. We've got the quirky little workarounds and also the the way that, um, you know, we're set up. So it matters what sequence of events you apply regulations against. Also, you've got the global piece about things things need to be worked differently depending on what regulation you're working to. So I think now it's it's not so much about the catalog, it's more about how you can apply that flexibly to your privacy framework to suit your organization. And uh, so thank you for that. And um, maybe, you know, um, double clicking on uh, this point, uh, if you could share a little bit from the challenges, pains that um, you experience along your uh, career in this uh, in the space. Um, you know, with you know, considering the fact that, as you mentioned, organizations have uh, no organization is the same, and um, you know, there are some tweaks and uh, and, and customization that needs to be done. But you know, from a business perspective, from um, you know, a uh, business owner perspective, what are the main channels, challenges, pains that you faced uh, uh, on this journey? I think perhaps dependent on 
on the organization and the sector. Um, so, for example, my experience within the private sector, uh, sorry, in the, in the public sector, then it's really difficult to get any leverage on um, technology within the organizations because you're always back of the queue. Privacy uh, is something that everybody wants to do, but you know, in terms of the priorities, it's it's difficult because the cost implications. So, and again, in, pri in private sector, the cost implications, privacy is not the front of the queue for anything. So when you start to realize the complexities of how you want to set your privacy framework, mm -hmm. um, trying to get somebody to support you to set up um, discovery, and also then you start to realize that it, um, you need to think about sequences, etc. And somebody set something up, you knew it was set up, you didn't know how it was set up, and then trying to find how you can get that supported, that um, development work to get those discoveries to be in operation is really tricky. Um, and it can sometimes be such a, a blocker to being able to move forward to, to get your privacy function running as smooth as smoothly and efficiently as you would like to got it and um did you ever had kind of uh this in general discussion of you know kind of build versus buy or should we customize it and tailor it internally uh in-house or go ahead on an expedition and uh try to work with a third party vendor um you know if you can um Take us through um, the main consideration there when we talk about, you know, the aspect of DSRs, the automation integration, and uh, the pros and the cons. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think if you start at the beginning of the privacy uh, journey in 2018, then every everybody was still tied to as little as possible investment into privacy, and so let's you know, let's do it on spreadsheets and let's, you know, what, what's the issue here? But I think it's quickly became the case that um, the amount of DSARs that were coming through and some of those are quite troublesome. You know, th there was a lots of organizations that were sending DSAR requests, even though they didn't necessarily know whether they had a relationship for some people. So I was working in organizations and they were getting totally bombarded and that quickly moved the, the, the point along to, we can't cope with this by designing anything ourselves. It's not possible um, to, right, we need to find a solution that's going to be able to support us to do the discovery and try and automate as much as possible, even though a lot of those organizations were complex because the time to try and resolve such a, a an amount of DSARs were, was a serious, hitting the risk registers really of um you know the exec team in in as much as we're not achieving our timelines so we've got to do something different all right um uh, um okay so thank you for that um uh, basically if we look at the the screen and the common challenges and norms that um that they collected from uh from our experience essentially it goes in line with uh with our you know, uh, conversation, every organization has its own uh, unique, um, I would say, structure and uh, unique uh, challenges. Um, I kind of collected here a few, um, you know, consolidate unique identifiers of an organization, find itself in a, in a position where the tech stack is so dynamic, things are changing so rapidly in, in their entire tech stack, um, and now they need to enrich um, um, the data and, and you know, uh, from other systems in order to be able to um, exercise an action of deletion, copy, or whatever on, an, on another system. So uh, that became, um, um, that's something that we see quite often. Integrating between uh, multiple systems, starting an operation on one integration, filling it, or, or system, finishing it up, uh, on another, let's say, ticketing system, uh, service now is just an example, but it can be any other ticketing system CRM that organization might have. Uh, We're seeing quite a lot um, things like DSR in delay, which means, in, especially in the e-commerce space, uh, we are seeing situation where there is an open order, we cannot really delete the data yet, even though the user asks for us to do this. 
uh, we need to set up uh, a, a delay function for like 30 days, 60 days or something like that, and only then carry out the, the deletion itself. Um, and uh, and also as all sorts, uh, you know, uh, so on and so forth. We see here anonymization versus deletion in different uh, jurisdictions. We see here uh, customizations of, you know, aggregations, ag aggregator, like uh, Domo is, is one example of uh, an aggregator uh, of, uh, of data and how the, 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 the specific organization set it up really matters on how you're going to apply uh, a specific logic. And I think something that we are seeing quite often lately is that the, you know, and Shirin, you talked about it uh, earlier in this conversation that one size fits all is not going to cut it anymore. Uh, or, you know, creating kind of, a, a, you know, the happy flow for all my territories is not going to cut it. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of changings, changing within uh, different regulations. Good example would be, you know, uh, under GDPR, we had uh, a certain set of uh, privacy rights. And then, uh, you know, companies that have businesses in the U.S. and California specifically now need to support a do not sell process, which is, you know, totally different. And now, you know, you need to adjust your uh, operation and the DSR, you know, automations accordingly. Um, so those are kind of uh, a handful of uh, um, top challenges and norms that uh, that we've seen. Uh, if you want to add anything uh, to that, Shirin, uh, that would be uh, great uh, before we go into the next uh, step of uh, this discussion, then we'll be able to share uh, some of uh, our latest and greatest here at MINE. Mm -hmm. No, I think I've already talked about the complexity. Um, I would say that Things are getting more and more complex as we're getting into, you know, more and more scope of AI and um, more and more quirky little things going on that it's it becomes harder for the privacy team to be able to keep pace to what activities they need to do. And, and also the different regulations, if you're certainly if you're spanning different jurisdictions with different regulations, how are you going to meet those timescales and to try and go back to you know, the the spreadsheet scenario where, you know, oh, do I need to do that today? Can I wait until next week? What's, it, it's, the, the privacy team are always small. Um, no, you know, going back to the resource and the, 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 the business has different priorities quite rightly. Um, and so privacy is never the higher uh, priority in terms of expenditure. So being able to run your team efficiently is so more, important now than ever before um, to, to stay one step ahead of everything. Got it. Um, all right. So basically on the next few slides, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, why building a pre-built library that can reach even 100,000 is not going, you know, uh, it's not really do anything uh, uh, to change uh, the matter. We talked a little bit about about it from you know the catalog perspective, I, I, so I want to go a little bit deeper on that, um, and we kind of cover this. Uh, basically, what we've seen is that enterprise have a unique environment, unique workflows that uh, standardize you know solutions, just not going to cut it. Um, basically, our clients always say you know uh, when we have this conversation that quality and flexibility are matter more than just quantity because if you have if you find yourself with a library of 8,000 integrations that you're not going to use, but you're not you're going to use your 20, 30, 40, 50 integrations, it is really important for you to actually have them tailored perfectly to your own specific environments. And more importantly, having them, you know, dynamically change, adjustable, uh, and not need, needing to wait for uh, the development team to add it to of a vendor to add it to their uh, sprints, their roadmap, and uh, wait months and months uh, in order for uh, a new customization to, to go in. Um, so that's basically the approach. And uh, I'm really happy to share that mine have introduced, uh, we just launched uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, what we call the Infinite Integration Builder. Um, to allow organization to customize integrations without, you know, the need for any developer resources, uh, basically 
you know, uh, stepping out uh, from this uh, influx of integrations, integration war, might people might call it, um, and create the infrastructure uh, that will allow the organization to actually manage uh, um, their own uh, customizations on a DIY uh, mode, if you will. Um, so basically what it means is that you will have an, infra uh, an, an infrastructure that any API out there uh, is being transmitted into a set of blocks and logics and is going to be accessible to the organization uh, in order to build their own uh, integration, see what the developer teams at Mine maybe built for them, and then customize it accordingly. So tapping on the couple of the examples that I gave before, um, here we have an example of a canvas that we've built for one of our clients when uh, in e-commerce. And this is a quick example that shows that uh, the organization have a trigger. Uh, somebody clicked on ask for a deletion request. They wanted to have an automation on Shopify. And then the thing is that in this step, um, the user asks to delete the data. We have here um, the condition and the condition say, if there are no active orders, go ahead and delete the data from Shopify, great. But if there are some active uh, order, maybe you want to wait for 30 days until we get back uh, to this, sorry, uh, and uh, and finish up this uh, this process. So this is tapping into one of the models, just showing how it is, easy it is uh, for anyone in an organization. You don't need to have any uh, developer skills. Uh, think of Zapier for the DSL world uh, and basically go ahead, choose your blocks, Choose your action, create your logic, and plug and play. Play around with it, um, and uh, it basically takes away the necessity of a developer team uh, by simply working with uh, a customer success manager or even internally uh, on a do-it-yourself mode. Um, so that's uh, one example. The other example that I brought today was when we had a client going into the U.S. and uh, needed to support a do-not-sell process. Uh, on their uh, Marketo uh, system. So basically what we're seeing here is that, you know, in this specific scenario, it is pretty complex. So what we needed to do was first, we needed to enrich the data with uh, additional identifiers coming from Twitter specifically in order to enrich the information with a mobile number. Um, then we needed to go ahead and delete the data. And by the time that we are done with it, go ahead and set up, uh, add the user to a blacklist because of the do not sell uh, requirements. At the end of the process, the organization also wanted to get a Slack message uh, to notify uh, someone you know, on the other side that uh, this uh, this process was, uh, was completed. So as you can see here, here we are talking about a process that is not necessarily, um, you know, just an integration that is out of the box. As a vendor, I can come in and say, yes, I have an integration to Marketo. Okay, but is this going to cut it for the entire flow that I need to tailor for my own organization? I need to go ahead and, you know, have the enrichment from uh, from Twilio, go back and enrich the data uh, of the ticket, uh, complete the process on Marketo, and then send a, a Slack uh, notification to the other side. So just having an integration to Marketo, which is the main system that we want to uh, uh, to address here is not going to be enough. So that was uh, one of the other examples. Um, that's basically what uh, we just introduced to the market. Um, Shirin, I would love to hear your thought about it, but, um, and uh, if, if, you know, uh, you're feeling from uh, from just seeing this um, and, uh, and yeah, um, then open it up for any questions uh, from the audience. Okay, it looks great. I mean, you know, taking taking us away from that queue of having to be reliant on, um, you know, uh, people supporting us and helping us to be able to meet the intricacies of what we've got going on in the business, but also thinking previous to where I've worked with other applications where we've had to be in a queue for their development team to build these connectors um, was frustrating as it was, but you can understand why, because 
organizations are so different and so how can you ever uh, predict what everybody's going to want from an application so we got frustrated waiting for things to be developed for us but really you know when you think about it they were never going to be able to meet our framework so easily so, so that's that just looks great the the fact that we can go away and test it out and try some of our um, more complex processes are probably simplify some some things but the I mean we've got situations where I, our identifiers are different so that's great to see that feature um, because that'll be super helpful on a couple of things um, so yeah excited to be able to use that and genuinely so um, because it is it's absolutely something that we'll always have a need for we'll always need to make some changes and build something like that because things are coming in all the time that make the changes to what we need to be doing all right um let's see uh if we have your uh quick uh question uh <clears throat> Would the DSR integration tool work with databases uh, or storage buckets like uh, an S3 bucket? So the answer is uh, yes, definitely. Um, essentially speaking, we are um, anything, any API um, connector um, essentially becomes, you know, a block, um, and everything is exposed into the um, into the canvas as you as I just presented. Um, the team of mine is happy to help, uh, but essentially it's just uh, a matter of setting up, you know, blocks of actions together with uh, some specific uh, business logics, set it up and uh, and let it fly. So the answer is yes, uh, could work with any uh, API that is uh, available out there. Um, yeah, of course, you, you know, for companies that have their own um you know internal in-house developers they are they are able to inject some internal code not really needed uh i believe for the vast majority of cases the flexibility is so high that um if i if we go back and talk about the use cases uh that they shared earlier in this presentation um all of them are being easily solved with uh with a new canvas All right. So um, I think um, we are just on time. So uh, Sharon, I want to thank you so much for uh, joining me here today if you, uh, and for your time. Uh, I hope it was interesting to you and to everybody that uh, participated in this uh, uh, quick webinar. Um, thank you so much. And uh, happy to take any questions. Feel free to uh, reach out to us later on and uh thank you thank you for your time okay.